What is up? What is up? What is up, everybody? Let us fire it up. I'm going to get so owned in this game. It's time that we get to the Steam Top 50 and seeing what the latest trends are. Gary's mod. There's TF2. It's usually around somewhere. Woo! Oh, snakes. Does it just have really high retention? This genre is still viable. Are you just trying to shoot his butt? There was kind of a trend for a while. Like, that is just the way things work. We did it! Happy New Year, chums. Good to see you all. Uh, welcome to the first Clark Tank of the decade. Uh, gonna be a good one, a busy one. Lots of retrospective uh, things to go over. Um, and we have a surprise new segment of the Clark Tank that we're gonna be doing all the time now. So that's gonna start today, which is really cool and exciting. Yeah, so we are gonna be playing Wildermyth. So the art style is not your typical tactics game art style. Especially this, it's like paper craft-ish. And very hand-drawn, cartoony. Typical tactics games are kind of either pixel art or kind of more serious sort of 3D art. I feel like this trailer is a bit long, a minute 40, but still good. Um, so it seems somewhat narrative focused as well. Like, does this stuff actually happen in the game, or is this cutscene, or what? But, uh, yeah, generative narrative stuff, uh, Tyreek, it seems super cool. So I'm excited to to check this out with y'all. And, um, like I said, it came, back, came out back in November, um, 500, you know, very positive re reviews since then. Uh, and I don't think that we noticed it in the top sellers chart in the Clark Tank uh, back at that time, unfortunately. So we missed it, but I'm glad that I went back and... Uh, Checked out uh, the, you know, best-selling indie games of the last few months and found this one. Uh, and their their descriptive text is, We call Wildermyth a myth-making tactical RPG. It empowers you to craft iconic characters who grow through deep, rewarding battles and interactive storytelling. Uh, the, the, the starting it out with We Call, we call it, you know, like this is the developers talking right to you, telling you what they call it. That's interesting. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Uh, it's interesting. It seems like they're doing innovative stuff, and usually when you do innovative things, it's kind of risky, and sometimes people don't really like it, but uh, but yeah, it seems like whatever they're doing, it's working well, so. All right, so, as is now becoming a tradition, we check out uh, <laughs> whatever articles Chris has written since the last Clark Tank, and this time he's talking further about anchors. So uh, last Clark Tank, we went over one of his uh, articles that was discussing that you need not only hooks for your game, but anchors as well. And you know, the high level uh, uh, TLDR of that is that there needs to be something that grounds people in uh, games or genres that they already know in order for them to be excited about it. And uh, Chris actually quotes what I said in the last Clark Tank when we were covering his article. So it's getting like infinite loop here. But yeah, I was talking about how with Necrodancer, our hook was the, the rhythm roguelike thing. And so I tried to keep the rest of it as roguelike as possible. Because if you just pile innovation upon innovation, then people don't really know what the heck the game is, what to expect, that sort of thing. And, and if you've already got one twist, that's really enough uh, if they're interested in that, in that twist. Uh, and for Necrodancer, I think that was enough for sure. Uh, and so Chris is just talking in this post about how he finds the anchors. Um, <clears throat> how he analyzes them. And so he, he talks about uh, romance writers and how they have certain rules about things that you can or, or should do and shouldn't do uh, when writing a romance novel. And he's saying that uh, what he's doing right now is he's working on a Metroidvania. And so he was looking at, you know, what are the things that you, the Ten Commandments sorts of things for um, Metroidvanias. And he lists them all out here. And he does say at the end, you know, you should know what they are and then, and then you know, be prepared to break them. Uh, and actually breaking them is kind of a way of generating a hook. Uh, you don't want to break too many of them, of course, but that's what we did with Necrodancer. It's, you know, it's a roguelike game, but instead of you move when you feel like, you move when, um, when the beat comes. I would think of Anchors as something more like when you're viewing a trailer or when you're looking at screenshots or a store page or something like that, you want to be able to identify it 
from that information as a certain genre so that you're, you know, you have that sense of familiarity. Not all these things are necessarily showable in, in trailers. Chris has talked in previous uh, articles of his about how showing UI and stuff like that in your screenshots and in your trailers can help give people a hint uh, what genre it is. And, and when he was watching people browse the store, he was seeing that they were looking for that sort of thing. They were trying to see, you know, if they could see the UI, it would give them a hint as to what kind of genre the game was. Um, so yeah, I think it's probably okay if your game doesn't necessarily have all of the, you know, the core tenets uh, of that genre. As long as on your store page, it's familiar enough to people. And of course, you know, you shouldn't take out all of the things that are common to that genre uh, unless you think you're actually making it better, unless your game is improved uh, because of it. Uh, but yeah, anyway, thanks, Chris, as usual, for the excellent article. You all should check it out if you haven't already. Uh, and this is another article from a Clark Tank viewer. It looks like Sergio's in the chat right now as well. So yeah, thanks, Sergio, for this awesome article. Uh, and what it is about is kind of a, a meta-analysis of what Danny Weinbaum did recently, so we covered this in the Clark Tank previously as well, where he uh, scraped a bunch of data from Steam and estimated revenue for those games and was then um, grouping them by tag and by uh, revenue band and things like that, and there was a whole lot of in interesting uh, conclusions you could draw from that. Um, so Sergio was interested in the same sort of thing and inspired to do something similar and see if he could reproduce those results and so he's describing that in this article uh, and there's a few uh, cool um, insights that came from it so this graph is a pretty cool looking graph so it's it's data from over 400 games that have been out for uh, five years and it's showing uh, the percentage of revenue after those five years and I did see that uh, and I think the red or the blue these are medium and median and average uh, lines here and they're a lot more flat than you would expect and I guess this green one is what Danny originally had in his first article um, so Sergio is just pointing out the discrepancy here but I did see on Twitter Tyler um, was mentioning that you know if this is if this percentage revenue is based on an estimate of uh, units sold based on the number of reviews that a game is getting that you know the reviews that you get later in life may be coming from heavily discounted copies of the game uh, rather than full price copies of the game or, or low discount copies of the game that you'd be getting earlier so that could account for some of the linearity here uh, but there's there's more uh, insights down below games released on steam over time nice uh, demarcations of where steam greenlight happened and steam direct happened so obviously greenlight had a big impact and then steam direct sort of like bumped us up to a new level and we've been relatively flat since then uh, but yeah, then the, the Indiepocalypse uh, sort of graph, so it's just showing uh, revenue bands. So the lowest 5% of games, the lowest 5%, you know, earning games, you know, used to be doing pretty well. And then, well, this is, must just be noise, because like, why was 2006 so bad? There just was not enough games, or, or they just did poorly, I guess. Uh, but yeah, it seems like the average was kind of here-ish, but now it's just extremely low um, since those Greenlight and Steam Direct games have come out. Uh, but I think I like what Sergio did here, and this is my kind of argument about the indie middle class thing. Uh, it, now he's looking at, okay, well, sure, some of these bands have, have gone down recently, but what might be more important to full-time professional indies like us is this sort of graph where it's like how many people are making over a million dollars uh, or $250,000 and is that going up or going down over time and so you know if you make over 250k maybe your game's profitable if it's a pretty small budget game but if you make over a million and you're an indie uh, that's probably profitable or, or at least quite close um, so it's cool to see that these graphs are indeed going up as was our intuition and we've discussed on previous Clark Tanks and like went up quite a bit in 2019 which is awesome to see. Uh, so yeah there's like 300 uh, games per year making over a million dollars uh, which is awesome and and yeah again seems to jive with our intuition and what we see on the Clark Tank. Back when we used to do the Clark Tank every week we would see you know most of the time there was a new indie game coming out every week 
that was going to make over a million dollars. And you know, people used to be surprised when I would tell them that. Uh, people who don't watch the charts as closely as we do, and I would tell them, like, they, they would say, oh, there's not very many games that actually succeed on Steam these days, or it's declining or whatever. And I'm like, no, we looked at it every single week. And there's usually one, sometimes there was two or three. I remember there was one week where there was like nine. It was crazy. Where like the, the top 10 or 15 had nine new indie games in it. Uh, and they were all going to make over a million dollars. So, uh, yeah, there are plenty and increasing, which is good news. So, you know, if you can be in that top few percent, and, and that's basically this, I suppose, highest 5%. You can see that went up and even highest 25% went up. So, you know, if you're on top of your game, uh, you can certainly succeed still on Steam. Uh, and that's the thing that I think is most important because we always, we already knew that even before the, the flood of green light and direct games, um, only, you know, one in every 20 indie games were actually profitable. Um, and that's, that's still the case. And probably actually uh, that figure is, is improving, which is cool. Five year review graph is on a log scale. Oh, okay. Yeah, good point. The median from 2013 to 2019 dropped by a factor of 100. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that is that is a good thing to be aware of. But again, you know, if you're looking at top 5%, and like I said, I've I've done various ad hoc analyses in the past, and it always seems like... It's hard to estimate profitability because you would need to guess their budget. Uh, and that's what I've tried to do, is just eyeball budget and estimate uh, revenue based on box lighter numbers. Um, and try to figure out, okay, about how many of these games are profitable, and it's about 1 in 20, which is 5%. Um, so good to see that uh, this has gone up lately, and of course that this is that this is increasing. Uh, Sergio also kind of tried to reproduce Danny's review score graph, just showing that review scores do correlate to uh, better sales results, and he didn't have that weird dip that uh, Danny had around the 70 mark, 70% 70 mark, so... This is about what we would expect to see. Uh, and then he has this really cool thing uh, where you can, well, he's got a whole like site here where you can do a bunch of different um, analyses. So you can look at these graphs, change it for whether or not you want it to be only for early access games, only for indie early access games, and see how the graphs change. Like this is super cool, Sergio, it's awesome. Uh, and then, yeah, you can drill, you can look at games by tags and see, you know, okay, estimated revenue uh, based on tags. So the best one is Looter Shooter <laughs> in terms of revenue. Um, and it's funny how the, the rating um, factors into things. So like Hero Shooter, also quite high on the, on the revenue side of things, but much lower than Looter Shooter. But I guess it's because these are small samples. Uh, and then you can actually click on a thing and right click and drill down into it. So like see all of the games that are inside this uh, tag. So yeah, thank you Sergio for um, uh, compiling this data and making it accessible to us in um, such a user friendly way. Uh, it's, it's great when our community uh, does stuff like this. Um, and yeah, and Chris and Danny uh, doing awesome things. It's just every now and then folks pop up with with cool gifts like this so thank you so much Sergio it's it's been a treat uh yeah other big news that happened um since our last Clark Tank is the IGF nominees were announced so I haven't actually browsed this in uh great detail yet so we can go over it together so for the Seamus McNally grand prize it's Goose Game not too surprising Short Hike which is cool uh we've we've watched the trailer for Short Hike on the Clark Tank uh, I haven't played this yet but I'm actually going to be playing it soon and talking with some friends about it um, Eliza is that visual novel from Zachtronics, which it was a surprise in itself. Uh, and I've heard from folks here at Brace Yourself that played it that it's really awesome, uh, and from other people on the internet as well that it's really awesome. Um, so I guess not too surprising to see it up up here, but uh, I don't think it's sold um, especially well, unfortunately. But you know, visual novel is a tough uh, genre. So Slay the Spire finally comes out of early access. If it were not in here, I probably would have been um, surprised. And then Anodyne 2. And so quite a few um, runners up, honorable mentions uh, mentioned there. So excellence in visual art. I don't know how you pronounce this, Mutazione. 
Mitezo Yone uh, is another sort of adventurous game, Knights and Bikes. Uh, this one was published by Double Fine, I believe. Void Bastards, which we covered on the Clark Tank. Um, Creature in the Well, Eastward. But yeah, all of these are great. <clears throat> Stone Story RPG, I'm not even aware of this one. Let's check it out. Whoa! Okay, so this is a, a nominee for excellence in visual art that is like ASCII art. I'm intrigued. Huh. <clears throat> There's a heart on the shield. In a world of perpetual ASCII. This is pretty cool. It reminds me of back in the BBS days when people used to make ASCII animations. Like I had a BBS with, with my best friend and he made sweet ASCII animations for them. He met the developer at GDC three years ago. Awesome guy. He makes all the animations in Notepad. What? Wow. It's a clicker game? Is it mouse based? It's not keyboard? Huh. Well, whatever it is, I'm going to play it. <laughs> it looks super cool. Uh, wow, I'm glad we're going through this. Already learning stuff. Um, okay, excellence in audio. Observation. Oh, I think we did watch this one. This looks pretty uh, high quality for an indie game. Huh. Okay, so this one was nominated for audio. Okay. Uh, excellence in design. Katana Zero. Lonely Mountains Downhill, I don't know what that is. Slay the Spire, Short Hike. Elsinore, we've talked about before. Patrick's Parabox, don't know that. Let's check him out. Oh, okay, yeah, we, I think we have seen this. There you go. <laughs> Why does it take so long to get to that? Uh, yeah, that one looks sweet. Patrick's Parabox. Oh, this is the one where it's like, you go inside a... It's like a... Inception, a puzzle within a puzzle within a puzzle. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, those all seem pretty excellent. Um, excellence in narrative. Mutazion again. Heaven's Vault. Elsinore. Wide Ocean Big Jacket. I don't know what that is. I also don't know what Lion Killer is. Any thoughts on some of the nominees having publishers? Ah, uh, hey, Sam, how you doing? Yeah, that's a good question. I thought before about us at Brace Yourself, like... This year, we could submit Industries of Titan and Phantom Brigade, or next year if we want, uh, to the IGF. What do you think, uh, folks in chat? Should we be doing that as Brace Yourself Games? Because um, we are much larger than many other indies. Um, <clears throat> we also do have some some investment, but we're like still fully independent. Uh, so I don't know if we should. Partly because, like, yeah, we are indie for sure, and we do what we want to do. Um, so I think we qualify technically, but whether or not morally we should do it, because there, you know, perhaps are other uh, indies that could benefit more from it, or it would help them more. And I, uh, in my career, have had four games nominated for the IGF, never won one. Um, so that, that makes it tempting. Indie just means not AAA, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a hard decision because it's also not just about me. I've had four games nominated, sure, but a lot of other folks at Brace Yourself have not had any, right? So what's a benefit from winning or being nominated if you're already established? I uh, Having the laurels so you can put them, you know, at the beginning of your trailer and things like that, it gives you an instant shot of, of, of credibility in the mind of the viewer, that sort of thing. Um... It also just, you know, makes the team happy and, and proud, for sure, to be nominated or, or to win. Um, yeah, it makes it so that press, you know, may be more likely to to pay attention. It's it's not a huge impact, and I think that the percentage impact that it would have on Brace Yourself is less than what it would on some first-time indie, for sure. So, All right, Nuovo Award, Tales from Off-Peak City, Volume 1. I think, all, like, all of these are going to be ones that uh, we have not covered on the Clark Tank. And then Best Student Games, Orbital Bullet, Juggler's Tale, Forgotten, Neon Beats. Oh, Neon Beats, that sounds like a rhythm game. All right, let's check that one out, and then we'll uh, keep moving. Clever writing. Some kind of camping adventure game. Oh, carrying the skeleton. That was weird. Bird watching. People watching. Cook them dogs. Cloan. 
That's a name. Okay, that was weird. Interesting. Uh, Wide Ocean Big Jacket is a new narrative exploration guy game by Turnfollow and published by Tender Claws. Experience crucial moments in a family's relationships, the peaks and valleys of love, young and old, and everything in between. The story of Wide Ocean Big Jacket is funny, tender, and at times tense, but always warm and true. Okay, so there's not uh, some secret mystery night in the woods thing happening in there. Uh, okay, Lion Killer. Was this a mobile game? Lion Killer is a choose-your-own-adventure game made in Twine. Oh, okay. Play as Hua Mulan, a young lesbian who is conscripted into the first opium war against the British Empire, run a flower shop, kiss a girl, shoot a matchlock rifle, and uncover a military conspiracy. Uh, Alright, last one. Last IGF thing, and then we'll move on. Neon Beats. Please have a trailer. Yes. Hmm. Okay, it's very 140-ish. Okay. Well, that was the IGF stuff. Now, someone in the Discord, the Clark Tank Discord, um, asked if we could discuss uh, discounting um, strategies and what I do and what other folks do. So, uh, but yeah, what we do at Brace Yourself for discounting is the fairly standard sort of stair stepping down. Chris did uh, talk about this as well in one of his articles recently that you get a bit of a boost every time you do a new all-time low because there are some people and he saw people browsing uh, Steam who were talking specifically about waiting for this sort of thing. Um, whenever you have a new all-time low you get this sort of a spike. Um, <clears throat> and so yeah you want to slowly stair step it down over time um, and yeah there's different theories on you know how quickly you should do that whether or not you should do it at all. There are games like Factorio that I think have never been on sale and obviously that game sells well but I, I do personally believe that Factorio would sell even better um, like significantly bit more units more revenue uh, if they if they did discount it even conservatively um, and yeah there's the other side of it like Steger's mentioning uh, discounting every time Steam lets you is the visibility side of things and yeah as I think your strategy will be different depending on whether or not you are uh, going to be on the the first page of you know this special offers page um, when Necrodancer goes on sale usually we're you know in here somewhere on the first page or in the first few and so if people are clicking on this uh, to see the special offers we're gonna get uh, more eyeballs just because we're on sale and so yeah we do every eight weeks when you're allowed to do a weekly deal we do that um, and on switch we also discount um, as often as we're able to because again it gets you a bit of a bump in visibility so I think that that is the best way to optimize for revenue there are of course costs to having more units out there at a cheaper price you might have more customer support um, because of it uh, but I think that there are, are also benefits if your game is the type of game that people talk about after playing or or if it's multiplayer and they play with their friends that sort of thing then just having more units out there will generate more word of mouth for you um, and I do think that Necrodancer is one of those types of games that people some people get really into it um, not everybody but there's like maybe five percent of people get extremely into it and they won't shut up about it and they start telling people about it so we benefit from just having more people have the game um, for sure also, if you are planning to make sequels or just any game that your your company makes in the future, uh, it's going to be easier for you to reach those uh, that audience. Um, so I do think there's value in the future of having more units out there too. Steger saying, if you're planning bonus content or updates or DLC, it's good to leverage those alongside with sales. Yes, I agree. And there are also visibility rounds. Um, we haven't talked about that in a while, so I'll go over that as well, just in case there are folks in the chat who don't understand how visibility rounds work. Um, Visibility rounds are a thing that you get and you spend. Steam gives you a few, a handful of them uh, when your game launches to spend as you choose. And when you trigger them, you get shown uh, on a certain part of the front page of Steam. Uh, and it used to be that you would just get shown to any random people. Now it only shows it to people who own your game or who have your game on their wish list. Updates and offers. So I, I think that's it. Uh, anyway, people, it, it shows up somewhere and you do get eyeballs from it. You can see it in the back end uh, that you get extra traffic out of it. But yeah, it shows it to people who own your game and who have your game wishlisted. Um, because when it was just showing it to random people on Steam, 
If those people aren't even interested in your genre, you would get a very low click-through rate. And we did notice this with Necrodancer that once they changed it, it was actually better for us. Our click-through rate went up much more um, because it's people who are already, you know, already own it. You're not going to sell it to them again, but maybe they'll play it again. Uh, and then their friends will see the little toast thing that pops up in the corner saying so-and-so is now playing Crypto Necrodancer. So you do get sales from that. But also everybody who has your game wishlisted, like, those are exactly the people that you want to see it. Um, so if your game is heavily wishlisted, has a lot of outstanding wishlists, then that's exactly what you want the visibility grounds to do. But if your game isn't already as well known as something like Necrodancer, then yeah, I could see how it would harm you. Because if you don't already have a bunch of people who own it or wishlist it, then you're not going to get much visibility at all. So, um, so yeah, if your game is, you know, at least moderately well known, I think it's an improvement the way that they do it now. Um, but if your game is not super well known, then it then it's a downgrade for you for sure. Um, so yeah, if your visibility round performs well enough, if it, I guess if it gets enough views or like the click through rate is high enough, then Steam can give you more of them. So I think with Necrodancer we've had I don't know like eight or nine or something like that, but we've stopped updating the game now. Um, but yeah, if they do well enough, uh, you get more of them. So you do want to tie them to an update or a sale or both. That's what we always did with Necrodancer when we were updating. We would put it on sale as well and pop a visibility round and then our click-through rates were, were much higher. Um, so yeah, I would recommend that folks do that for sure. Um, Tyreek's asking, how large of a discount do you do for those frequent ones and do you do deeper cuts for events like holiday sale, etc.? cetera? Uh, right now with Necrodancer, we've kind of bottomed out at like 80% off and we discount on the DLC 50% off. Um, and I guess we could go lower than that, but I don't, I don't think we will. You know, it's hard to estimate what the, you know, it's so cheap that, you know, it's just, a, it's pennies, basically, it's just a few bucks if it's 80% off. I don't feel like 90% would change things too much, and then that would be like 50% less revenue. Um, so I feel like 75% or 80% is around that, like, oh my god, it's, it's basically as cheap as it's ever going to get, I'll just buy it if I'm going to buy it, especially for a game that's 15 bucks like Necrodancer. So we just keep it at 80% all the time. And then the DLC is at 50% as a kind of a vehicle for generating more revenue. So a lot of people do buy the bundle, which includes everything. And uh, so hopefully draw them in with the 80% off. And then when they, they're at your store page, some of them might upsell to buy everything. And then we generate a bit more revenue by not discounting the DLCs as much. So anyway, that's my theory. I don't know if that's optimal, but that is what we do, and it certainly uh, does. Necrodancer makes us a lot of money, but I don't know if it's because of this strategy or what. Uh, Steger, you've been putting all your games on sale simultaneously. Yeah, I think that's smart. Um, there, You do get some extra traffic from people clicking on your name as a developer or publisher and then going to your other games. And if they're also on sale, that will help. Uh, Hoarded Soviet saying, do you think multiplayer games benefit more from discounts in large player base than single player games? Yeah, I think that they do. Uh, especially if your, you know, the size of your community is uh, low and, you know, if people are waiting for matchmaking and things like that, then you should, you know, discounts will benefit you um, more for sure. Do you think sales during early access is a good idea? Yeah, we did do it for Necrodancer during early access, although I think we we refused to go lower than some certain amount. I can't remember if it was like 40% or 50% or something. Obviously, you want to keep some of that gas for later, but um, it, from what I could tell, the sales results that we had from the sales that we did during early access versus the ones afterwards is similar. So I don't think that you should avoid it or anything like that. I would still do the stair step, but maybe be slightly more conservative. Trying to pull eyeballs to your game is hard, but if the number of releases made the old way of visibility grounds untenable, yeah. So once they started Greenlight and stuff, they knew that it was not possible to keep um, using visu visibility rounds the way that they used to work because there's only so much real estate on the front page of Steam, and so games were getting fewer and fewer impressions. So they changed the way that they work. You feel a bit torn when delegating resources to new projects instead of existing projects? Yes, definitely. Like, we could be updating Necrodancer more. Like, there's tons of stuff that we wanted to add to Necrodancer that we didn't get to do. Um, but we weren't able to. But at some point, you as a developer, you just want to work on new things. Uh, and everyone else on the team wants to work on new things. So even though we would, you know, I think if we just updated Necrodancer forever, 
it would just keep making money, more and more money forever. And you can see this with lots of games. And we still have a strong Necrodancer speedrunning uh, streaming community and stuff this many years after, you know, it's, it's been years since we updated the game. Um, so yeah, we could, but we, we got into video games because we like making games, we like making new things. So if we're not having fun doing it anymore, you know, we get a bit tired of working on the same game all the time then uh, we, we just work on new stuff. So even though it might not be the best short-term financial decision, I do think that it's probably the best one long-term um, because if you are a larger company like ours with you know a, a large number of people working with you, uh, you wanna make sure that they're happy and that they want to stay working with you, right? You've got lots of talented people here at Braces Health and I want them to um, be happy working on what they're working on and if if i just say nope you got to work on necrodancer forever uh they may not be too happy so um and yeah also i wouldn't want that for my myself either so why would i do that to other folks and anyway i'm confident that we, the new games that we make will do well as well it may be hard to match a hit like necrodancer but it does seem like um industries of titan and phantom brigade based on our wish list numbers are going to do quite well so um yeah i'm not i'm not too concerned about it and it's more it's more fun uh, this way. How frequently do we stair step down? Uh, with Necrodancer, we stair stepped every time, every summer sale and winter sale. So we saved the big ones for those. I think partly we did it in hopes that we would get more prominent featuring on those sales because if you do get prominent featuring from Valve, uh, I don't know if it's, it was hand curated back at the beginning of the Necrodancer time. I'm not sure if it's now totally procedural now or, or what, but um, uh, if you do stair step, you may sell better and then catch the attention of the algorithm, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it seemed to work well for us. So I do think that that's a wise thing to do. Uh, so anyway, that's the brief uh, coverage of discounting strategy. Um, someone in our Discord requested that. So there you go. Uh, Valve posted the top sellers of 2019. So let's check these out and see if any of them surprise us. CSGO, we could have guessed that one. Warframe, Elder Scrolls, Rainbow Six, Civ, Monster Hunter. Hmm, I guess it's not that surprising. 100,000 reviews. Um, but yeah, it came out in 2018 and still selling well. It just had that uh, update, although um, that was 2020, not 2019. The most recent update, GTA is still there. PUBG, Dota, Sekiro, uh, Destiny. It managed to uh, sneak into the the top tier despite uh, <clears throat> only coming out in October. So pretty impressive, 170,000 reviews. And Total War Three Kingdoms. So yeah, this one, um, of all the strategy games this year, uh, the best selling, I suppose. Well, that and Civ. All right, gold. So Halo, Dead by Daylight, still going strong <clears throat> despite coming out in 2016. It was that long ago? Holy smokes. Yeah, this game just keeps on selling. Final Fantasy, Assassin's Creed, uh, Jedi Fallen Order, Witcher 3, came out in 2015. Uh, I see lots of people talking about it uh, these days because of the show, so I wonder what kind of spike they're going to get from that. Uh, Mordhau, some folks at Brace Yourself have been uh, getting into Mordhau. Uh, Rocket League, uh, five years, four years later, still going strong. It's good to see. Resident Evil 2 and Path of Exile. All right, so any indie games... Uh... Depends on your definition of indie. Um, all right, silver. Let's see if we see any indies in here. RDR2, TF2, there's Risk of Rain. 43,000 reviews. Uh, okay, bronze, there's gotta be a lot of indies in here. Paladin, Hitman, House Flipper, Forest, Far Cry, Aspenir, Totally Accurate Battle Simulator, Hunt, Showdown. Dead by Daylight devs are from eight countries, all remote, interesting. Mordhaus indie? Oh, okay, that's what you're talking about, Danny. Uh, Stardew is in here, yeah, definitely indie. Uh, it came out in 2016 and still in the bronze area. What else? Overcooked. Conan still going strong despite coming out in 2018. Subnautica. Two Point Hospital. Beat Saber. Uh, Frostpunk, a year after launch, still selling well, which is good news for us with our Industries of Titan game. No Man's Sky. It had some updates and stuff this year. Bloodstained. Don't Starve Togethers, constantly getting update updates. Crusader Kings, this is the oldest uh, game in the in this uh, list from 2012. It is still in bronze. Holy smokes, are they still updating it? And Cyberpunk, not even launched in bronze. Is this the only not launched game? 
in this list, it might be. Is Factorio not in here? Usually Factorio and RimWorld are like pretty close. I don't see it. All right, well, yeah, nothing too surprising in there. Of course, it shouldn't be too surprising to us because we pay attention to this every time we Clark Tank. So, yeah, RimWorld 1.0, uh, uh, which I guess would generate a big big spike in sales, so that would that would make sense why it's in there. Whereas Factorio, I don't believe, has 1.0 yet. Um, <clears throat> so here's new releases. So this will be a subset of what we just looked at. Might include some different ones. Uh, because a lot of those games that we just saw, like Crusader Kings, are old. Um, so of the new ones, the top sellers... Uh, oh, it's it's sorting it by... I guess this is for the whole year and then by month. So yeah, we might see something surprising in here. So yeah, for January, okay, yeah, now it's starting to get a little bit more indie and a little bit more surprising. So I remember we checked this out and it looked cool. 700 reviews. Uh, first person base building survival game set in the steampunk era. So, okay, so in January, this is one of the best sellers. While to learn is a programming game at Overflow. So instead of Stack Overflow, build a cat speech recognition system with a visual programming language? Sure, why not? No problem. Anyone can do that. What even is this? Build a self driving car. What? Okay, so just like a rud rudimentary self-driving, all it does is go left-right when it detects things. It's teaching about machine learning. Oh, okay. Huh. A video game that teaches about machine learning. It is a cool world that we live in where uh, a, a totally nerdy game like this about machine learning can sell so well and be in the top sellers of January. How did we not see this last January? 2,700 reviews. This is freaking nuts. Okay, so we, we already knew that um, Zaktronics style um, programmery sorts of games were viable. I wouldn't have expected one that this hardcore could do this well. 91% positive too. Well, like how how much has Zaktronics like uh, how many reviews do they get? Around the same. 2,000? Okay. But like those have been out for longer. It came out in 2015, whereas uh, this cat game just came out last year. So it's like selling better than Zaktronics games. Okay, well, if you can keep your budget small-ish, which, you know, none of this should really, you know, the, the art and stuff would cost you some. And of course, the programming and design and what would, would cost you some. But... Um, this game, you, this genre, can definitely be viable. Uh, okay, well that was surprising. Let's check out this other one, Amazing Cultivation Simulator. Oh, they didn't even localize their text. So it's like a farming sim, but what? With magic and stuff and combat? How much you want to bet that 90 plus percent of the reviews are in Chinese? Looks cool though, I wish they would localize it. Yeah, I wish they would localize it. It's crazy how many reviews they got, um, even without localization. Uh, okay, well, that was just January. What else are we going to discover? This is awesome. Pogo, what is this Pogo Stuck? The dev of Pogo Stuck is often in here? Hmm. Pogo Stuck is a rage game. Yeah, I mean, the, the visuals look like they would not require a large budget to make, which is cool. Whenever I see stuff like that, I get excited because often people say, oh, you need huge budget, you need to be triple I indie and stuff like that to succeed these days, but stuff like this shows that you don't, and also that machine learning game, you don't need a massive budget for those things. People say it's harder than uh, getting over it. Popular with some heavy hitting streamers, sweet. Okay, that makes sense then. Well, yeah, congrats. You made it in the uh, top sellers of February. All right, March. Okay, just We the Revolution, I think, was, is new. This is pretty grim. Freedom. Wow, is the they just put a head on a platter. What is gameplay? Wow, they really uh, went deep on the heads on plates and beheading uh, angle. As a judge of the Revolutionary Tribunal, preside over complicated cases of ordinary citizens, dangerous criminals, and enemies of the revolution in revolutionary Paris, make judgments, plot political intrigue, and try not to lose your own head. Oh, that can happen to you? That's a unique angle. Uh, I gotta hand it to him. But yeah, 600 reviews. It's not a not a massive seller, but may have may have been profitable. Okay, April. Okay, I don't think there's anything surprising in this one. May. 
What is this? Banner of the Maid. Okay, let's check out this game. So many city builders. Everybody loves a city builder. Two minute trailer. Okay, there's gameplay. <laughs> they just showed a bunch of their illustrations first. It's kind of mobile-ish. Is it free? No. Weird. Uh, Banner of the Maid is a turn-based strategy game set in the time of the French Revolution. Hey! Okay, so it's a tactics-ish. Okay, so that was May. June. Okay, nothing too surprising there. July. Swords and Souls we covered. Okay, nothing surprising there. August. Rad. This was the Double Fine game. Um, wow, it made the top charts with only 300 reviews. Yeah, it's a shame it didn't sell super well. It looks beautiful, but yeah, this genre is kind of difficult, like ARPG, basically. Monster Sanctuary. Harness the power of your spectral familiar. Obviously. Oh, they evolve. They're like Pokemans. Okay, so it's like, like a Pokemon side scrolling game published by Team 17. Interesting. I don't think that we saw that before. Monster Taming meets Metroidvania. Collect, train, and battle monsters in a lovely side view pixel world. What came out in September? Train 4. Somehow that slipped under our radar. See, I thought that Train 3 didn't do that well, and I was wondering if they were going to stop. But but they're back in the... So Train 3 was like fully 3D, right? Well, this is obviously 3D graphics, but um, now it's back to the side view. 2,300 reviews, but it looked like Train... Had 1,200 reviews, yeah, and then trying 3, they made it um, more 3D-ish, and people were upset about that, hence the mixed reviews, and it didn't sell nearly as well as the, the predecessors, because, yeah, the original trying 2,700, so, again, we talked a lot about making sequels and stuff, and, you know, just because a game uh, sells well doesn't mean it's always the best idea to make number 2, and then number 3, and then number 4, uh, but, you know, at least... Hopefully, this number of reviews does mean that it, uh, Trine 4 was profitable. All right, we're almost done here. November. November is Call of Duty time. Yeah, I guess November is big AAA game time. Uh, okay. And then December, usually also questionable. So Ashen, despite having mixed reviews, still made the cut. And Hades, do Hades has almost 8,000 reviews. It's insane number of reviews. Wow, congrats to Supergiant. It is doing so, so well. Yeah, so like rhythm games, music games, totally viable still. Uh, we should make more Necrodancer games. And speaking of music games, Sayonara, Sayonara Wild Hearts uh, got lots of award nominations and, and uh, awards uh, recently. Congrats to them. All right, let's check out uh, this winter resort simulator. Trees shaking strangely in the wind. I love, I love when pe people put epic music to things that don't warrant it. <laughs> That's, slam that slider to max. People just love their simulation games. Finally get to use a snowplow, yeah. Okay, uh, another bit of Steam news is now they're going to make it so that soundtracks are like a first-class citizen on the store, which is cool. Previously, what we did with Necrodancer is you have to like make the soundtrack via DLC and then just the soundtrack files get dumped into the game's install folder and people can go find it there, which is not awesome. And so now they are making it so that um, Steam will have like a way on the Steam app to just like look at all the soundtracks that you own uh, and play them and stuff. So uh, we're definitely going to be um, switching all of our soundtracks over to that. Um, so you'll be able to hear Danny's sweet tunes. Uh, via this new feature um, once it's up and running so but yeah it's great news people have been asking for this sort of thing for a long time and Valve listens so thanks Valve you're the best uh, alright now it's time for the new segment the new segment we've been talking about um, how we should be paying attention to not just sales of indie games on Steam but also on Switch because Switch is becoming a huge part of revenue for uh, indie companies such as ours. Uh, we now make more money with Necrodancer on Switch than we do on Steam. Um, although that's partly due to the fact that we made Cadence of Hyrule, which is Switch exclusive. So we get kind of a halo effect from that. Uh, so now we'll be able to look at the top sellers on the Switch every Clark Tank like we do on Steam. 
Uh, which is good. Because... Yeah, some indie games sell better, many indie games sell better now on the Switch than they do on Steam, so we should certainly be paying attention to what is going on. Uh, so yeah, Mario Kart, Overcooked, man. This thing just always, it does so well on the Switch, which makes sense because it's, it feels really good to play on the Switch, and you can play it easily with, you know, two people on an airplane, which uh, people from Praise Yourself do all the time. Um, so not surprising because of how good of a game it is but just like man this is number two of all games and it's been out for so long they're just printing freaking money same with stardew although it's on sale cuphead doesn't it's not too surprising rabbits is 75 percent off nintendo doesn't usually do such giant sales like that i wonder if because you know it's a crossover thing they're more willing to discount it but holy smokes yeah i wonder who is controlling that ubi or nintendo or what uh, Minecraft's usually going to be around here somewhere. Goose Game, Pokemon, Smash Bros. I played a lot of Smash Bros over the Christmas break. Uh, Luigi's Mansion, Rock League, Pan Pan. So what is this? What are you, Pan Pan? Irik is already into the style. It's kind of an exploratory adventure game. Chains of environmental puzzles. Monument Valley. Give me slight Monument Valley vibes. Uh, so yeah, it's cool to see this doing well because I think that... It would not do especially well on Steam, and it's not on sale, um, so it's not doing well because of that. Is it... does it say on here when it came out? It came out two years ago? Okay, maybe it was just recently on sale, and now it's, it's lingering in the charts. Because, uh, in case you're not aware, this top seller's chart appears to be based on units sold, not revenue. Um, so when people heavily discount their games, they get into this chart and then they get more visibility. So some people kind of use that to their advantage to um, generate more sales. Okay, so Overcooked, uh, the original. So Overcooked 2 is in the number 2 slot and Overcooked the original is in the 15 slot. Like, they're just printing money. Mario Party Just Dance is on sale. The other Pokemon, Breath of the Wild, just always selling. Human Fall Flat is pretty impressive. Uh, Mana Spark is from... Uh, friend of the Clark Tank, Ed, and he's in here because he's 90% off. Uh, Witcher, I'm surprised this is not higher, which, again, shows how different the uh, audiences are on these different platforms. Like, it just came out in October on the Switch, and it's 30% off, pretty decent deal, and it's only number 23. A bit surprising to me. Okay, now I'm going to switch to the other tab, download only games. So once we get down... Around here, yeah, that was the last one uh, that was in the previous Top Sellers chart, so there should be more indie games in this. Does this chart have things fall off as a factor of time, or is it a matter of getting bumped off by other things? No, uh, Tyreek, I'm pretty sure that it's a, a moving window of multiple days, possibly even a week, which could be why that game that we just watched the trailer of is still hanging around despite no longer being on sale. Um, it definitely seems like the time window is wider than the Steam one, because if things don't move around as much as they do on the Steam top sellers. Uh, Ori's in here because it's on sale. Hollow Knight, wrecked. 60% <laughs> off, so this is a $2 uh, car game. Final Fantasy, Wrecking Ball Adventure. See, the tricky thing about this is like some of these games might be in here because they were previously on sale, like, uh, and now they're just sticking around because of the way that the algorithm works. So it makes it hard to draw conclusions um, I guess week to week. So ne next time we Clark Tank, we'll see. Will Wrecking Ball Adventure still be in the charts? I bet not. Drawful 2. Colero, 90% off. So it's in here because it's uh, on heavy sale. Defunct. What is this? And was it on sale previously? It would be nice if there was a way for us to tell. Was this game recently on sale? Because if it was, we might want to pay less attention to it. Uh, Crazy Zen Mini Golf. Final Fantasy 8. More Jackbox stuff, Ultimate Chicken Horse Uno, Baba's You, Astro Bears, Taiko no Tatsujin, uh, and Terraria. We just uh, saw that on Steam as well. But yeah, that was fun. Slightly frustrating that the way that the window moving window works uh, is going to skew the results, but let's keep doing this every Clark Tank and we will uh, begin to get a feel for things like. I imagine that Cuphead's going to be there, Goose Game's going to be there, Human Fall Flat may be there as well, I'm not sure if it's there because it was on sale, Castle Crashers and stuff like that, Jackbox I think is probably a pretty good game for the Switch. Um, the problem is 
Lars, it would be nice if someone could scrape this every day uh, and do make you know tools the way that we do for the Steam um, top sellers, but I think it's hard to get this data because um, it's not visibly it's not visible on the web anywhere. You have to log in via a switch to the eShop. Uh, okay, now let's quickly do our Steam homework here. And we might skip the the uh, Kickstarter stuff this week because we're running a bit long, but we'll see how we're doing for time. So Monster Hunter World is at uh, number one because it had uh, DLC, uh, which is at number two, come out a couple days ago. So this is not too surprising considering how well Monster Hunter has been selling. CSGO is always there somewhere. Romance of the Three Kingdoms, so this is uh, pre-orders. It's coming out soon. Let's check it out. So this is the 14th installment in the series. I have never played any of these games, but I bet I would enjoy them. Sweet, sweet hex grid. All right, GTA 5, PUBG, Path of Exile is not surprising. Rainbow Six, RDR, Destiny, <clears throat> Monster Hunter Deluxe Kit. Okay, wow. So they have like in the top 13, they have three SKUs. Crazy. Warframe, Dota. Dragon Ball, okay, so this is the pre-orders we saw last time. Halo, uh, Black Desert, Rocket League, man, none of this is surprising. Elder Scrolls, Witcher, Surviving Mars, what? It must have been on sale, it's dropping off now. World of Warships, Planet Zoo, Dead by Daylight, like none of this is surprising. Age of Empires, so that's why it was hard to find new games to play this week, because like nothing really has launched and done well, except Sands of Salazar, which is why I considered playing it. It's tapering off now, it was higher in the charts yesterday. Uh, Rust, Snowman's Sky, Star Wars, Lords Mobile, Raft, Football Manager, GTFO has been doing well since its launch in December. Ark, War Thunder, Cyberpunk, so yeah, this is the pre-orders for Cyberpunk. It's been hanging out in the top sellers the whole time. TF2, Total War, so now we're getting into the territory where some of these games don't always show up, but I think they're showing up because there's nothing new to push them down out of the top 50. Uh, Paladins, Skylines, Beat Saber, it's crazy how much money Beat Saber makes as a VR game. Uh, Warhammer, Total War Warhammer, Daisy, Train Simulator, okay, it's just because it's on sale, Stardew. So yeah, normally Stardew is not, well, it's not always in this, uh, in the chart, but I think it's just, there's nothing new pushing it down. So Gemcraft, this is a new game. What the heck are you? So this is a tower defense game. Does it have a unique hook? Gemcraft is cool. Started as a flash game? Yeah, it's. I'm pretty sure I did play this as a flash game. Yeah, I do think tower defense games are somewhat viable on Steam. Perhaps not the strongest genre, but... Things like They Are Billions and whatnot uh, is viable. <clears throat> this is consistently the slowest time for new releases each year. Yeah, we'll see when we get to your chart there, Harbor. Uh... The gem building gemcraft is pretty deep. Yeah, I remember enjoying it. Uh, okay, Train Sim World is on sale. Boneworks, uh, we've talked about. The Hades, Streets of Rogues on sale. Uh, e Football, NBA, Wilson. It must have been on sale. It's dropping off. Risk of Rain, and just because I think we're uh, that's a weaker week right now. It's poking its uh, head into the top 50 in World of Tanks. Okay, so yeah. Not a lot surprising other than Gemcraft and, uh, what was it called? Sands of Salazar. Uh, okay, so top wish list. We just usually check this out just to see if anything new is collecting wish lists. It's not in the top sellers, but collecting a lot of wish lists. Oh, massively multiplayer RPG, getting lots of, uh, wish lists. Okay. Wait, Spirit Fair. Simulation. All right, let's check this out. This is supposed to be a simulation game? It does not look like a simulation game. Okay, there we go. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I hope every time you use you swing your pickaxe, the animation is not that long. This animation is great. Oh, this game has feels in it. That should be a tag. Lars, can we get a new tag on Steam for feels? All right, well, let's look at the uh, new and trending just to make sure we haven't missed anything. White Door, is this, it's got 250 reviews. Is this free? Oh, this is a Rusty Lake game. Okay, that makes sense now that it would have this many reviews then. 
Rusty Lake, it's a... How are you feeling today? A franchise. Of... We advise you to stick to... Adventure room escape sorts of uh, games. To exercise your mind. Uh, fight of animals. <laughs> you think that game has feels? Yeah, it might have feels, it's true. Whoa! The cat is experiencing feels. Whoa, it's a long cat. I don't... I experience feels. I don't know what to make of those feels. Surprisingly solid fighter. It, it, it seemed legit. I... wow. Too bad we're not playing this. Maybe next Clark Tank will play this. <laughs> what is happening? What? Okay, this is a contender for the Clarky uh, 2020 edition. Uh, Clarky for, you know, best trailer in Christmas. Power Hook Dog. Mighty Fox. Walking Cat. Magic Squirrel. Gorilla. Muscle Beluga. <laughs> Muscle Beluga. New an Oh, man. I like fighting games, too. I am going to play this. 95% positive. I want to be king of animals. Why is it only like $5 American? All right. Well, let's go. <laughs> we I need to I need to lower my excitement levels about that game because we have homework uh, still to do here before we can play some Wildermyth. Uh look at the hypestergram to see how many games have been coming out. There looks like there was some some anomaly because I'm sure games were launched in this period. Uh, but <laughs> Very low number of games launched in the last week or so, which is not surprising. Uh, let me refresh this. So this is Harbor Pirates moving average graph showing uh, how many new releases we've got. And here we got a new color. We got purple. Look, we're right now we're higher than any time in the last few years. Uh, so yeah, we dipped low. So 2019 is this tan color. And we were below all the other years until... December, people actually launched more games in December this year than usual, or than in 2018 at least. And now more in January than usual, so a little strange. We'll see if this uh, trend continues. Uh, all right, okay, let's really quickly do uh, the Kickstarter report. We looked at Jelter last time. That seems like a common thing on, on Kickstarter is they sort of list uh, features that are not necessarily like unique or hooky things like ability based progression would you play it just because it has ability based progression like what is the thing that is novel about that game all right let's just watch this one see if there are hooky things about the game that they could have used in their description so kind of metroidvania ish graphics are cute yeah my concern with this is just what what makes it stand out you know it's it's pretty um, but there are other games that are somewhat similar right so but it looks like it'll probably make its goal, which is good news. So good luck to the devs. I hope it works out for you. All right, greetings. What are you called? As you play, your account will build up a rich legacy. Oh, interesting. Okay, so there's multiple stories. Age of Ulstrix. A three-chapter story that is geared towards new players face off against the implacable Gorgon leader, Ulstrix. So there's also Heart of the Forest, a campaign to teach you how to make a campaign. Whoa. Oh, so you can make your own. So this is not yet a complete experience. Uh, difficulty, J.K. Rowling. <laughs> That's cute. Lovecraft is like max difficulty. Snarky Greed Wagon. What's a Greed Wagon? We don't need two hotheads. So many hotheads. So many hotheads! We don't need two peacemakers either. Compassionate Greed Wagon. Alright, well let's see what a Greed Wagon is. Sounds bad, but everyone's life is their own private legend. We're all hoping the hero gets rich in the end. Oh, it's because she's a greed wagon. That's why she's saying that. Uh-oh. Smoke! Oh, okay, we get to choose. Winden must have tried to cook breakfast again. I really can't leave him alone. Okay. Are we feeling romancy, friendshipy, or rivalry -y? Ah, let's romance him. Are there bad guys in here? Uh-oh. A hero can do a single move, which takes one action, or a double move, which takes both actions. Well, we probably want to get close to this house, right? So maybe here. Hoppity hoppity. So there's no animation on the characters. <laughs> Funny animations. Distinguish it with your face, Anatha. 
It reminds me somewhat of Necrodancer, uh, the way that they hop around. And we did it in Necrodancer initially uh, because it reinforces the feeling of the beat, but also because it's uh, it's less animation budget required that way. Garu! Ooh, what is that? Ooh. You know what? Fork them. Uh, let's fork them. Makes it look paperish in a good way. Yeah. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Seems guaranteed. We did fork them. Scouting. In order to find sites in the wilderness, heroes must scout the land, which takes time. Click on an unscouted tile to show the scout action. <laughs> Spoon or staff? Spoon. That's what the tick would choose. Open wide. <laughs> I like it. The writing is really good. Diffuse with an object, then use the object to attack. Use the interfuse ability to connect with fire or scenery. Different types of scenery give different effects and abilities. Many of these let you use the scenery to damage enemies. So this, her ability? Okay, what's this? Grain bags. <laughs> the object you've interfused with has an ability you can use. Different kinds of objects do different things. Is it constrict? Three magic damage, six range. Serpent of animated fabric. One, yeah, okay, this must be it. Hobbling it and squeezing away its life. That sounds good. It hobbled it. And did three damage to it. Splinter blast. Savages an area. That sounds good. Let's savage the area. Right next to you, I guess. Constricted him. And yeah, I think we have the general idea of how the game works now, so can can uh, form some opinions about it. But yeah, I I enjoyed it quite a lot. What did you uh, folks in the chat think about it? I'm definitely a big tactics fan, um, and we went through a couple battles there, and I understood the combat pretty quickly. And it seems like there's a neat variety of things you can do. It's not just all hack and slashy, although I guess the variety was mostly coming from that. Um, um, the mage type type character there, but yeah, it seems like there's there's more and more variety that's still coming. Um, and yeah, the meta game seems pretty neat. A lot of tactics games, it's just all the tactics and the main meta progression that you get is your character's improving. But here, there's a whole map component to it, and um, you know, harvesting more resources and stuff like that by leaving your your heroes in different spots. Um, the whole narrative side of it. I guess we would have to play through a whole campaign to see, like, looks like maybe there's a meta-meta narrative thing, so, like, as you play multiple campaigns, then things change for you as well. I'm curious about that, but it'll probably take me a few more hours of playing before I really understand how that all works, but um, the writing that was in there um, was pretty compelling. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. So, yeah, this just shows that uh, indie tactics games if they're well made, can can do reasonably well. Um, I'm not sure what the team size is. Four full time, right? That's awesome. Yeah, that's the type of thing that we look for on the Clark Tank. Is you know genres that are viable for indies, small teams of indies, um, because that's the type of thing that we could then, you know, us here at Brace Yourself or others in chat, um, we could decide to make games in that genre as well. So I think if you do make uh, a tactics game with an interesting twist like this one. And if it's well made, like this one, then um, then you could do well uh, too. So yeah, it does seem like tactics is a viable genre for indies, uh, and that's kind of what I wanted to learn more about by by playing this game. So um, yeah, thank you, Wilder Myth team. It was a fun game. I'll probably play it some more on my own uh, off stream as well. But I enjoyed what I saw. Um, I enjoyed it quite a lot. So yeah, thanks for your hard work on it. Appreciate it. Well, I think that's going to wrap up uh, the Clark Tank for this time, chums. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you next time, chums.